Hashtag RIP LPSCs. Mm, yeah. You're listening to The Cosmic Cast. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Cosmic Cast. I'm John Panay Fisher. This week is a slightly different episode. Um, We're also here. I'm Rick Viver here. <laughs> Thanks, John, for the for the mention there. Hi, it's Marissa. I was getting to that. So we were supposed to be right now in Houston, Texas, for the 51st Lunar and Planetary Science Conference. But unfortunately, because of this coronavirus thing that's going around, that's been shut down. And in fact, most scientific conferences the past few months have been cancelled and no one's really doing these kind of meetings anymore. But but regardless, we all put a lot of effort into our mm. abstracts and some of us have already made our posters and our talks and all that. So we thought best not let that go to waste and we'll get all the people that were due to present that week uh, on this podcast today and uh, we'll just talk about some of the cool science we would have been showing off in Houston. So no wings for me or margaritas, um, but lots of science. And the, these are the abstracts I've got in my hand, a bit of foley there for you all. Uh, so John, it would be great to hear from you first. Um, I believe you were going to be a, doing a talk on the Monday morning. Monday morning at half past eight, that which sounds... actually... Well, it's, it it's sounds good... early, but the jet lag would have been in my advantage, I think. So mm. I would have been awake early anyway. But it does mean I would have had to limit my exuberance at the icebreaker the <laughs> night before. And we couldn't have had that. No, no. So hopefully yeah. that comes across to all our listeners today. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, it'd be great to hear about your abstract on thorium-rich lunar regolith breccias. Yes, thank you. So um, I was actually quite surprised this got a talk, so I didn't think this was going to be exciting enough. But regardless... Um, yeah, so, so these are just some samples that um, we bunged into the noble gas mass spectrometer. They're um, an odd bunch of these lunar regolith breccias, so these samples that are hanging about on the on the surface of the moon, but they're thorium rich. Yep. Uh, and they're and not, breccia meaning it's all been it's all been mixed apart. up, yeah, broken yeah. up. Yeah, so it's it's a sort of a, a, a rock that's consistent of loads of different like lithologies. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's not a formal grouping of regolith breccias. It's only about a, a handful that have been sort of classified as like so-called thorium rich. And what's particularly interesting about some of these is that they some of them contain basaltic fragments uh, that have been dated to be some of the oldest volcanism on the moon, dating back to about um, 4.3 billion years ago, I think. So um, understanding... Um, these particular regular breaches, understanding their exposure history on the lunar surface, mm-hmm. you know, how old they've been sat on the lunar surface and mm-hmm. this kind of thing. And also as to whether they're all paired is quite important for understanding um, where this old volcanism is and how this sort of ties into understanding the sort of the start of, of basaltic volcanism on the moon. Um, so the, the actual point of the study was to use the noble gases, and this was similar to what Mark Nottingham was talking about a few weeks ago, was that you can use the noble gases to... Um, effectively date how long a sample has been sat on the lunar surface. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's because uh, of something called um, uh, cosmic ray exposure on the lunar surface. So cosmic rays, I think we've mentioned before, we'll put a link to Mark's episode in the description if you want to hear more about this. Um, But cosmic rays are just the sort of uh, intergalactic rays, I think mostly gamma rays and also other particles I can't quite remember. But anyway, they're high energy. Uh, and then when they smack into the surface of the moon and so and all, this, all the, the rock and, and debris that's on the surface, they cause these reactions uh, of, of the major elements that, mm. are, that, are how, that are sort of bound up in the minerals mm. and, and, and noble gases are produced. Um, and so by measuring the amount of that particular noble gas that's in these samples, and if you know uh, the production rate of, of solar wind, uh, sorry, of, of, of cosmic rays, you can then estimate a date for how long they've mm. been hanging around mm. on the surface. And so, um, so we looked at um, uh, three particular samples, um, uh, and it turns out that in terms of their xenon, uh, cosmogenic age, um, they all have ages that range between uh, 861 and 981 million years. So that sort of suggests that they probably sample, they've, they, the, all those three samples have been on the lunar surface for roughly, obviously, you know, give or take 100 million years on, on the surface for a similar amount of time. So that's quite interesting. So that means that potentially they've been sort of sourced from a similar location. It's mm. hard to tell whether they've, they've come up from the moon in the same impact event, mm-hmm. what we call a launch pair. 
Uh, but it sort of suggests they share sort of similar exposure histories. Um, and so that that's quite interesting. Um, and I guess it sort of leads on to some wider discussion about, you know, where were these things sourced from? Mm. And um, So, yeah, can you date, can you use uh, crater counting ages to try and pinpoint some craters that they may have come from? Well, Obviously. so what you can use is some of the, 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 the X-ray not x-ray you can use some of the so the orbital mission that's constantly collecting mm -hmm. chemistry data from across the surface of the moon to try and match the bulk chemistries of these samples mm -hmm. and the chemistries of the lunar surface mm -hmm. and what's interesting is that when you do that for these samples they the, the locations that overlap for all three samples are these basalts um, that are to the north of the mare basalt they're all high titanium. Sorry, mm. no, they're all low, low titanium, titanium, which is a feature of some of these very old basaltic class mm. that have been dated. Um, and so it's a good likely candidate of where they may have all come from. Um, but what's interesting is that there's, there's one sample. So there's something about low titanium basalts and them being very old. Um, unfortunately, these exposures to the north uh, of, the, of the main sort of mare basalt units on the, on the lunar far side are quite young when they've been dated for crater countering, mm -hmm. and they're not consistent with four billion years or four mm -hmm. and a bit billion years. And so it's possible that what we're sampling is just older stuff that's not exposed at the surface, yeah. if it's a particularly deep crater or... Um, but the other sort of famous yeah, example of um, uh, a really old, uh, mar a real old basaltic um, uh, class that's been dated is from a sample called Kalahari 009. Um, and that's really different in terms of its chemistry. It doesn't seem to be part of this. Uh, wasn't, it's not contained within one of these high thorium regolith breaches. And so it suggests that you've at least got two different locations that are sampling these really old bits of volcanism. Mm -hmm. So so it was starting to sort of build a picture that perhaps what was going on when volcanism was first started was that you had these small isolated areas on the moon where you perhaps had these very small eruptions. But um, But anyway, that's more or less what I was going to talk about. Hope that makes sense. Had you started uh, making your talk then, John? No, I hadn't started making my talk. <laughs> well, it's it's all right then. You have been rewarded. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, anyway, so yeah, hopefully I'll try and present this work at another conference because I think it's still interesting enough to to talk about somewhere else, hopefully. So yeah, interesting. The Cosmic Cast. And so next up, Sam Bell is going to talk to us about her abstract. Now, anyway, we're in a slightly different room, just in case uh, you can hear a distinct difference in the audio quality. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much for coming along to talk about your abstract. Now, you also were going to have a talk I was. Uh, on, on the Monday as well, actually. Yeah. Was it Monday afternoon? I can't remember. Same session as your talk. Same session. Yeah, there we go. A, just a few after. Right. R.I.P. <laughs> Hashtag RIP LPSC. Mm, yeah, yeah, get that trending. <laughs> anyway, Sam, so what was your abstract about? Um, I was looking at diffusion modelling of olivine crystals in Apollo 15 Mara basalts. Um, so olivine's just one of the main minerals that we would find in some of the Apollo 15 basalts. Um, and when crystals grow, they um, they take in sort of the composition of the melt that they're in and reflect their environment that they're growing in. So if there's a change in the composition of the melt, that gets reflected in what we see in the crystals. So some crystals end up with zoning and um, the crystal doesn't like to be zoned. It would much rather prepare, prefer to be sort of one consistent uh, composition. So the zones try and even each other out. And so what happens is atoms diffuse across this boundary and uh, the process is all like time dependent. So if we know the compositions of some crystals within the sample that have got zones, we can work out how long they've been diffusing for. So what are some of the key results then? How long have Apollo 15 you mentioned? Yeah, yeah. So there's uh, within the Apollo 15, there's like two suites, two groups of uh, of samples. Um, so I was looking at seeing if there's any like differences in times between the two samples mm -hmm. and. There's no massive discernible differences. Um, all the time scales, on average, are less than five years. Mm -hmm. I think the proper average of each uh, sample ranges from about one to about three years. Um, so yeah, they they all seem similar at this stage. So is that normal for uh, uh, for these sorts of lavas? Have people reported similar ages or? 
Um, so, like, it, it depends for lunar ones or for terrestrial ones. Um, so whether the ages seem a bit ha a bit long or a bit short, um, I need to have a look at it because we're refining some of the ages. So right. uh, some of the interpretations aren't quite there yet because mm -hmm. um, we think there might be growth mixed in with the diffusion right. as well. So yep. we need to nail down the time scales a bit more first before we can sort of make some um, yeah interpretations from what we've got. Mm -hmm. So uh, what form are your samples in then? I'm guessing you started with your big samples and then you've sliced them up and done some fancy things to them? Yeah, so they're all thin sections. Um, so they're all uh, pre-sliced before we get them by NASA. Um, and then, yeah, I've just gone around each thin section trying to find crystals that uh, look like they've got zoning in them and then they're the ones that we've picked. Mm. That's really cool because obviously these rocks are probably a couple of billion years old. Yeah, yeah, 3.3. 3. Um, and yeah, so these processes that were occurring in the magma yeah, chamber or as years it was old. ascending would have been happen happening a couple of billions of years ago. Yeah, and you're mad. looking back in time at that. That's really cool. Yeah, it's exciting. Is there any overlap with your abstract then? Like, So would, would some of the, the, the crystal residence ages have any implications for some of your volatile modelling? Um, so most of the magmas that I've been modelling are quite high temperatures, so they don't really have many crystals in. Right. Um, so it could be that... Mm, so I've simplified the scenario for my modelling and just gone based on the geochemistry of the magmas that I've been looking at, this is what the liquidest temperature was. This is the point when they were molten, mm -hmm. let's say. Um, so I've just taken a single stage from molten magma ascending to the surface, whereas I suppose, Sam, your work is looking at if there's stages uh, for the magma to be ascending. Yeah, and, well, yeah, I guess it's slightly different in that, yeah, it's um, working out what the zoning represents in terms of the magmatic history um, whether it's like a simple history or possibly hinting at like more complex mm -hmm. history yeah because, because would would a lot of this growth be uh, once the lava is on the surface cooling or would it be like in a conduit or in a magma chamber oh, that's a good question um potentially edging more towards a lava flow um just from some of the characteristics of the profiles we've got mm -hmm. um but yeah, it's going to be interesting to see see what the time scales give us and what what we think that might that might mean. Yeah, because I suppose a lot of the work that you do is probably based on like the techniques that people use for like Icelandic basalts. Yeah, yeah. Um, to understand plumbing systems underneath um basaltic volcanoes. Yeah, same idea. Yeah, same same sort of methods that people regularly use on terrestrial systems. Mm. But I suppose with the moon, we obviously don't know the the relation yeah. the time relations between oh well this is when the uh, lava was erupted onto the surface here is when we've sampled it yeah. now we're obviously just seeing it a lot yeah, after a long it's amount like of time sort of having like a jigsaw but not the picture to work out what you're actually meant to be looking at yeah <laughs> well, let's just hope there are no pieces missing <laughs> yeah, no pieces. yeah so this was going to be your second time attending LPSC I believe yep, yeah yep, second run yeah went last year for the fiftieth. Yeah, it was, it was yeah. Good. and in it fact, you're really wearing good. the 51st T-shirt today. Yeah, so that's going to be quite the exclusive uh, limited is. edition T-shirt, I would have thought. Bought it way before it got cancelled because yeah. it was super keen. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, no, it's limited but edition, it, so you know. That's right. Yeah. You should get it signed by Jack Schmidt next time you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but it is a wonderful conference, isn't it? What What are the, some of the highlights you enjoy about LPSC? I think because it was like it, it was so big, and you got to see everybody, and you got to see loads of different stuff that was going on in planetary science like I know, I know we have conferences here and stuff but mm. like yeah just the scale of it and obviously you get to see a lot more people that like have maybe wrote papers that you've read yeah. and it's like it's celebrity spotting and yeah yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it feels like you're properly doing a conference because <laughs> yeah. it's like it's all like the top people are there and it's yeah yeah it's for fun. sure well cool. thanks very much Sam Thank you for and uh, we'll put the link to your abstract Thank in you. the description in yes. the description and we're also live tweeting uh, our talks as we go along as well so you may have seen if you follow our twitter and there'll be some more uh tomorrow as this is broadcast on thursday so uh yeah, check that out for more lpsc content from us thanks very much sam thank you and we should also give a shout out to ben um who's actually not well at the moment sadly uh 
Hope you're all right, Ben, uh, who was also supposed, supposed to be attending LPSC this week. So Ben's abstract was looking at the ordinary chondrite Chico um, and looking at different volatile species within that meteorite and seeing if there was evidence of variable volatile behavior during and after impact melt formation. Uh, so if that floats your boat, uh, we'll put the link to Ben's abstract in the description as well. Indeed. The Cosmic Cast. Okay, so next we're joined by Amy Smith. How's it going? Hey, good, thank you. So um, you were supposed to have a poster on the Thursday? Uh, on the Tuesday. On the Tuesday, right, on okay, okay. So what was uh, what's your what's your abstract about? So yeah, my abstract has got a pretty long title, um, but I was basically looking at experimentally constraining the formation conditions of silica-rich rims around chondrules and CR chondrites, which is basically what my project looks at just now. And they're really unique because you only find them around porphyritic chondrules and CR chondrites, so you don't get them around like any other type of chondrule. And they, you do get igneous rims around other chondrules and most people just accept that they're formed by accretion. Mm -hmm. So you've got a chondral dust kind of accreted onto the surface, it was melted and that's your igneous rim. Mm -hmm. What but, do you mean by an igneous rim, sorry? So yeah, so an igneous rim is basically a rim around a chondral that has igneous minerals in it. Right, okay. So they've just got like olivines, pyroxenes, that's all. Right, okay. Um, and, and the only the difference with silica rich rims is you've got actual silica grains in right. there that you don't see in or other ordinary hmm. igneous rims. Interesting. So that's, I guess that's quite unusual then to have such evolved stuff in, yeah, in chondrals. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, and that's why we're looking at them because yeah. they are only in this one group, but not a lot of work has been done mm -hmm. on them. Mm -hmm. um, and especially in terms of their for formation. So some people think uh, that they were accreted like the igneous rims. So you've got a chondral dust is on it or silica rich, something silica rich mm -hmm. it was accreted onto it and it melted but recently some people think that actually what happened is condensation so you've had like a partially molten chondral and um gas such as sio in the nebula condensed mm -hmm. into that and then as the chondral cooled you get this rim but i mean there's arguments for and against either side yeah. and it's really hard to you know know what was actually happening um but in both of those models nobody says oh the peak temperature is this it likely cooled this fast mm -hmm. so that's what we've kind of been looking at by recreating them experimentally re yeah so we've I, did, I studied all the natural ones to kind mm. of get what minerals were there mm, so yeah. in the natural you have nice big silica grains high calcium pyroxene low calcium mm -hmm. pyroxene uh, glass plagioclase and then we got a bulk composition of one of those rims that's my starting material mm -hmm. for my experiments. Um, we put it in the furnace and heat it up and cool it down. Um, and we used diff various different temperatures, various different cooling rates that we can think of to try mm. and see when it starts looking like natural samples. Right, that's really cool. Yeah, so we've done 17 experiments so far and quite a lot of them do match. We've been quite lucky <laughs> in terms of like being able to constrain it quite easily. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we found that if you've got Peak temperatures, it's a little bit different in my abstract because I've done more experiments mm -hmm. since then. But now what it seems is, is peak temperatures from 1310 to 1510 degrees Celsius right. with um, linear cooling rates between 30 and 90 degrees an hour right. will give you the basically the mineralogy uh, and like the texture that you see in natural samples as well as the silica polymorph. That's cool. And that's the first time that sort of temperature regime has been constrained. Yeah, yeah. like no one that's else. Awesome. In, the, in the literature, it's more just like high temperature. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. what yeah. does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Well, even doing these experiments are quite interesting, I guess. So, so I've seen on Twitter some like short <laughs> videos of yours where these like molten balls just sort of drop. Yeah. Yeah. So that's... So they, they're, they're quench experiments. So what we do is we heat our sample up to a high temperature, like 1600 degrees. Mm. And yeah, you remove the bottom of the furnace, have a beaker of water under there. And we've set up like a little mechanism inside, which allows basically our sample is suspended in a little thin platinum wire loop. And that gets wrapped around thick platinum wires. So if you pass a current through those thick platinum wires, it burns mm -hmm. the thin pla mm -hmm. platinum loop, which causes your sample to drop out the furnace. So that's what those videos are. They're really the sample's really really hot. It's instantly dropping into the water, so it cools instantly. Right. But it makes quite a good, cool video because mm -hmm. yeah. you see a little glowing ball. Yeah, it's, like it's a really cool. Chondral. Yeah, well, we'll stick a link to that in, uh, in the description yeah, box yeah. underneath because it's quite neat to check out. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. Amy, thank you very much. And you. Uh, are you going to upload this as an e-poster? Uh, 
No, I won't be uploading it as an e-poster, but I will be putting it on my Twitter page. Cool. It's not quite finished yet. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, that sounds pretty good. And then the, the link again to the abstract will be in the description yeah. box. And I think we're going to do a blog post about this on our blog at um, earthandsolarsystem.wordpress.com as well, yeah. listing all the various abstracts that are, that we're talking about today. Cool. Thank um, you. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, thank yeah, you. Nice one. Cosmic Cast. So, Marissa, so you had a poster, didn't you? Yes, I, I was going to be presenting a poster in the Planetary Volcanism session, mm -hmm. which I think was on the Tuesday on evening. The Tuesday evening, very good, very good. So you you avoided me bringing a camera and uh, doing a vlog then. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sticking the camera and the microphone in people's faces yeah. at the most flattering angles. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. But ironically, you now have a microphone stuck into your face, and you're going to have to talk about what you did on your poster. Yeah. <laughs> Can't wait. Um, yes, so I was going to be presenting a poster there, which was mostly done. Um, so for those who don't know, um, I'm in the second year of my PhD now, and I guess it'd be handy to go into the over overarching outline of my PhD and then explain what part I was working on for LPSC. Um, so I look at modelling different volcanic processes on the moon. Um, so those processes are magma ascent and then eruption onto the surface um, and the whole idea of my project is that um, I'd be using lots of different lab measurements, um, information from satellites, geophysical data and inputting all of those parameters into some sort of magma ascent model um, and then feeding the results from the magma ascent model into an eruption model um, which would look at how deposits form on the surface of the moon and then I could ground truth both of those models using images and digital elevation models of the lunar surface. Um, so this isn't something that's really been done before. Most of the information, as I said before, that we have um, about lunar volcanism comes from samples or images. So this sort of modeling approach is something a bit different. Um, it's taking lots of terrestrial models and applying them to the moon. Um, so the piece of work that I've been looking at for LPSC um, is quantifying the effect that different volatile contents have on magma ascent dynamics. So to break that down, um, magma ascent dynamics is all of the processes that are occurring during magma ascent. So temperature change, press pressure change, crystallization, changes in viscosity um, and also gas X solution. So that's the main thing that I'm looking at. Um, and this can be really important for understanding what volcanic eruptions on the moon were like. Um, the moon isn't volcanically active at the moment um, and probably hasn't been for about a billion years. So modelling these processes is quite useful for turning back the clock and trying to look back in time. Um, and also there's lots of questions about the effect that volcanic eruptions had on, say, a lunar atmosphere. Um, that's something that's a bit contentious. So understanding the nature of volcanic eruptions on the moon can help us understand knock-on effects like that. Um, and then the reason why I'm looking at varying the volatile content in my magma ascent model is because um, there's been lots of measurements of returned lunar samples and meteorites as um, for measuring the amounts of volatile elements, so uh, water and uh, uh, other uh, carbon dioxide, things like that. Um, but there's quite a big range in these measurements. Um, ranging from, you know, only a couple of parts per million up to thousands of parts per million. Um, so that's why my method for my PhD is sort of looking at using an alternative method for verifying the volatile contents um, that the lunar interior had or has. Uh, so the main results I've been getting from my magma ascent model have been looking at a process called fragmentation. So this is a sort of transition point when magma is ascending within a conduit from um, a bubbly magma to um, pockets of magma suspended in gas. Mm. Um, so basically the point when the magma is turning into fragments of magma. Um, and this is quite important for thinking about what your eventual uh, volcanic deposits will look like. So we're uh, talking like the glass beads versus all the fire fountaining and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So um, for those who don't know, uh, there are these pyroclastic glass beads on the moon. Um, we also see them on Earth. Um, if you look at pictures of, uh, they're called Pele's Tears, and they're little glass beads. The football player. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Very sad. Um, he was always sad. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> very into volcanology yeah. as well. Yeah. He was. Yeah. Yeah. So these are small glass beads which have cooled or quenched very rapidly. Um, and these are quite important in the in the tale of lunar volcanism because um, there are inclusions of gas within these, those volatile elements I was talking mm-hmm. about before. Um, and yeah, so understanding how uh, the point at which fragmentation occurred within the conduit helps you understand what your eventual deposits are going to look like. Mm-hmm. So um, you can essentially work backwards then, right? So because you know what the deposits look like. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so you can. Yeah. So yeah. you're uh, yeah, trying to invert your model to try and um, work out what the volatile content of your magmas mm. was. So most of my results at the moment uh, from the magma ascent model are about the depths at which different gases are resolving within the conduit. Um, and going back to fragmentation, there's sort of a an unofficial threshold at which fragmentation occurs, mm. which is when your magma is reaching around 70% gas. That's the point at which fragmentation will occur. So that's the thing I'm looking for in my results at the moment, um, the point at which the ascending magma is reaching this threshold. Mm. Um, and I've been testing the model for lots of different compositions, lots of initial volatile contents based on the lab measurements mentioned previously. Um, and yeah, trying to identify which of my simulated magma ascent scenarios will actually produce fragmented magma and which ones will go on to produce these deposits of pyroclastic glass beads. Uh, so yeah, this piece of work's been a pretty helpful step in my PhD so far. It's sort of the first step. Um, and then the next step, I'll be looking at feeding the results from the magma ascent model into some sort of eruption model. Mm. And yeah. And you're writing this up as a paper at the moment. Yeah. I am, yes, which is quite difficult, uh, I've been finding so far. Um, this is your first paper you've written, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, my second, because uh, I've bashed out a paper about the work that I did in Durham last summer, nice. um, which I found a lot easier to write because it was a very nice discrete two weeks worth of work mm-hmm. to write up. Whereas the whole PhD project, all the different parts are very much linked. Mm-hmm. So trying to write one discrete paper that stands alone, tells its own story has mm-hmm. been quite difficult so far. Yep. Um, so yeah, I redrafted it yesterday just to try and reframe the question and that's really helped so far. Mm-hmm. So. Are you going to upload this as an e-poster? I will be, yes. Um, as I said, the poster is nearly done. Yeah. Um, so for those who don't know, uh, LPSC have all of their abstracts and all of their posters online and available all year round, I believe. All the time. Yeah. yeah. yeah all the time. Yeah. So yeah. we'll link in the description everybody's abstracts and e-posters for those people that are uploading them. Yeah. Um, we additionally did one for the Cosmic Cast. There was an outreach. Yes, I, I brought it here. So yeah, yeah. so there'll be even a, an e poster if anyone's interested yeah. about um, sort of some of our analytics and yeah. sort of analysing how we think we've done over mm-hmm. the past year. And of course, if any of you listeners have any feedback for what you'd like for us to do more of or anything like that, do you know comment us or tweet at us. Oh, we're um, getting close to 100 subscribers. At the so, time of recording, yeah. we're at 98. So if yeah. you could all like, comment, and subscribe, we'll make sure to do a very special video. Mm-hmm. And if you know anyone likes science, yeah, suggest it to them. Absolutely, so yeah. Give yeah, it a listen. Yeah, distribute this far and wide. Yeah. 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 Okay, then. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, again, links in the description. Um, so we'll be back next week for some more regular content. But until then, hope you have a lovely week and stay safe and wash your hands. Bye. 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 Oh,